Um, I think crypto is probably going to be the way that AIs pay each other at the start. Like, what are the standards going to be for AIs that work on your behalf and my behalf, exchanging value? You know, crypto is the best way. Are they going to have bank accounts? Probably not. So, kind of, what are the rails for that? Hey, everyone. Welcome to The Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dad from Fourth Revolution Capital, and I'm joined here by my co-host from 4RC Nomadic. Today, we're talking with Ahmad Mostak, who is the founder and CEO of Stability AI, the world's leading open source generative AI company, which is the team behind the wildly successful Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion is a text image model used to generate detailed images based on text descriptions. Just one month after the release of Stable Diffusion 2.0, four of the top 10 applications on the Apple App Store were powered by Stable Diffusion. Our team at Fourth Revolution Capital have been working under a mandate to invest at the intersection of Web3 and AI since 2020. As an angel, I personally got involved in one of the earliest crypto AI projects back in 2021 called Aletheia AI, whose founder, RF Khan, just happens to be an investor in Stability AI. At 4RC, we're proud to say we invested in the seed round for Stability AI in spring 2022, before the public release of their AI text-to-image model in August 2022. Now, we as crypto natives, as Web3 people, we believe the future of AI models, AI technologies, and AI products should be open and that our best tool for ensuring all of this is open source and permissionless to access or build on is Web3. Web3 meaning blockchains, decentralized infrastructure, tokenization, DAOs, and so forth. Given how early we are in terms of developing at the intersection of Web3 and AI, with very few teams operating in this space, we're here today to talk about this emerging sector with one of the leading builders in open source AI, Ahmad Mostak. By the way, as a follow-up or even lead into the podcast, I've previously interviewed RF Khan of Aletheia AI about why AI needs Web3. If you're interested to learn more, you can find that in our show notes or search for it in YouTube or in podcast format at defidad.com. So before we get started, just a quick word from our sponsors who make the Edge podcast possible. Mantle, a DAO-governed ecosystem of decentralized and token-governed technologies powered by Mantle's native token, MNT. Its flagship product, Mantle Network, is a high-performance Ethereum Layer 2 network built with modular architecture. At Mantle, we're passionate about supporting builders and created a milestone-based grants program for promising Web3 projects. Calling for ambitious Web3 entrepreneurs, visit mantle.xyz forward slash grants and apply for it today. Whether you're a trader, farmer, analyst, or newbie, you can trade smart with KyberSwap, the OG decentralized exchange and aggregator on 13 chains. Swap at the best rates, farm with real yields, set limit orders, use their proprietary trading and AI tools with the best UX in DeFi, securely and permissionlessly. Get better rates, better opportunities, better alpha, and a better trading experience. Trade smart now at kyberswap.com. Gtrade by Gains Network is a decentralized leveraged trading platform, allowing users to synthetically trade crypto, forex, stocks, and commodities with up to 1,000x leverage. Gtrade is live on both Polygon and Arbitrum, with over 30 billion in all-time trading volume and nearly 50 million in vault liquidity. The platform has consistently been among the top earning protocols, with seven-figure monthly revenue and a net deflationary token. Gtrade has become an on-chain staple for both traders and yield seekers. Check them out at gains.trade or by searching Gains Network on Twitter. The future of Web3 is bright, but crypto startups, DAOs, and on-chain organizations can't scale without tooling to power world-class financial and payment operations. Introducing Utopia, your all-in-one platform to create, execute, and understand your Gnosis-safe transactions. Execute payroll 10x faster through automated payment plans. Coordinate reimbursements and accounts payable through payment requests. Execute multi-sig transactions faster with your global team through signing links. View, label, and categorize all of your safe transactions in one place. Start managing your on-chain payments today by going to utopialabs.com. To get started with gasless payments, message Utopia's co-founder on Twitter at 0 Kaito. It all started so simply with CryptoKitties and Maker on Ethereum, but quickly became complex with more applications and many chains. Today, everyone agrees, UX issues are the biggest blocker standing in the way of crypto adoption. 
Introducing Avocado. Multi-chain UX redesigned from the ground up. The first wallet to abstract networks, accounts and gas. One gas tank to pay transaction fees on all chains in USDC. And native access to Instadap's powerful, custom DeFi strategies. Avocado, one wallet to rule all chains. Let's give a bit of background about Ahmad before we introduce him. So he did a master's degree in mathematics and computer science at Oxford University. Prior to Stability AI in 2019, he founded Symmetry, a startup aiming to reduce the cost of technology for those living in poverty. Then Ahmad was CIO at an emerging markets hedge fund and chief architect at a global initiative using machine learning to combat COVID. Finally, in late 2020, he founded Stability AI to, quote, maximize the accessibility of modern AI to inspire global creativity and innovation, which we're going to talk all about today. So, Ahmad, welcome to the Edge podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thanks. Yeah, so we typically start off with how our guests got into crypto. However, since we'll be discussing both crypto and AI today, maybe you can give us your crypto origin story as well, of course, as your AI origin story. Uh, let's see. I think about the same time, uh, about 12 years ago, um, kind of got into crypto. One of my uh, old college buddies was Ben Dello, who co-founded BitMEX and told me about this lovely thing called Bitcoin. Um, and so kind of got into that. And I've lost more crypto than probably anyone I know through lost keys over the years, uh, from Dogecoin to Bitcoin to Monero to other things like that. Uh, but I was always fascinated by how identity was at the core of it. Um, so I contributed to a bunch of identity protocols and other things. Uh, always just trying to figure out, you know, how can we use this for coordination and shilling point? Uh, about 12 years ago as well, my son was diagnosed with autism uh, when he was two years old. And that's when I got heavily into AI. I've been in tech about 22 years ago. I started as a programmer, enterprise developer, writing assembly code for voice over IP software at Metaswitch. Um, but then I became a hedge fund manager and then I went back when they told me there was no cure, no treatment, and it was very severe. And so I built a little AI team, uh, did natural language processing to analyze all the autism literature, and then looked at GABA glutamate balance in the brain to repurpose drugs to calm down his brain, um, to allow him to recover the ability to speak and things like that. And so kind of both synchronized, but from different perspectives at the same time. So interesting. You, you really do have the background that uh, is normal to us in the crypto space where you've just worked across so many different sectors and and then looking backwards it yeah you connect all the dots and it all really makes sense uh so a large majority of our audience likely has roots in crypto but not so much in ai for those who are newer to ai or wondering why we're all so excited about uh potential synergies between these two worlds working together can you share a bit about just why you believe in AI um, for those who are new to it, you know, why it is, um, I think, as you've described it, the most important technological advancement in our lifetime. Yeah. So if you look at Web2, Web2 was AI, Google, Facebook, what are they? The AI, there was this big data target with ads. And it was like, oh, let's break free of this and have this kind of distributed ledger that allows us self-sovereignty, identity exchanging of value, right? That was the core of kind of Bitcoin. Can you do that in a trustless kind of way? And then things built from there. But what does that really mean? Um, all money is a story. So it's a story that we've got. And again, Bitcoin is a story. NFTs are probably the easiest way to become part of a community and a story, you know, because you buy it and you're bored ape or whatever. Um, I think these are kind of very interesting because we had the payment value transfer rails because the core of computer science is that this is kind of classical Shannon information theory. Information is valuable in as much as it changes the state. So what is Bitcoin going to come place on? It isn't really. It's just changing a parameter and that's valuable, you know, and it can be incredibly valuable. <clears throat> so what we had was we had the payment rails. We had the identity protocols, the wallets, and then the distributed identity and all these other things. And what we were missing, though, was the intelligence, the intelligence to route information. Because what is a Google and Meta's business model? They have intelligence to take big data and target you with ads. You know, how does conventional money work? It goes across systems, but it's just moving again bits or changing bits from one place to another. And that bit is accompanied by a story. So I was always flabbergasted by the lack of intelligence in crypto and Web3. Because you don't have something looking out for you, you know, like if you're going for distributed identity, 
and decentralization. Sure, you need decentralized intelligence as well, because it's very tough to make your way in the world and figure out what needs to go where. We had kind of automated market makers and other things, but again, this is classical old school AI. This new school AI is something very different. Um, so with Stable Diffusion, for example, our image generation model, it takes 100,000 gigabytes of images and the output was a two gigabyte file. It's impossible to compress information that much. It compresses stories, it compresses concepts. Like my son learning how to talk again. The word cup means cup your hands, cup your ears, world cup, all these other things, a latent space. This is what it compresses. Chat GPT is probably like two to 10 trillion words compressed into 100 gigabytes that you can then compress into 20 gigabytes. That's insane because it can pass all these license exams. Can that something different? So this new generation of AI, generative AI, uses supercomputers to do this, flips the equation just like crypto did. Because you used to have to have this massive amount of big data and then massive Google, Facebook server farms. Instead, what we do is pre-computation of these little models that act as primitives that you can then run on your MacBook now. So you can have a language model or an image generation model on your MacBook to generate anything that's valuable because you're taking chaos and turning it less chaotic. You can have intelligence to the edge because you flipped the energy equation. Again, inference is cheap. Creating the models is very hard and expensive. Whereas gathering the data used to be expensive and running the inference required massive scale. So I think that's why maybe this is the missing part of what we were all looking for, for this kind of independence, for this kind of coordination, for the requirement not to have oracles and the centralizing infrastructure, um, and really have a promise of what I call the intelligent internet. Every single person, company, country, culture, having their own AIs that represent them and their objective function is to work for them rather than selling them ads or manipulating them. Um, I think that's a very kind of powerful idea and concept because this comes at a time when the other side of it, a centralized version of this technology, will be even more manipulative and be even more controlling and even more centralizing. Because there's always this question, is it centralizing or not centralizing? So I think, you know, this is why the combination becomes exciting because we can have new design patterns, we can have new elements. And, you know, some of the promise that occurred early in crypto can come through. Uh, because we can maybe even finally integrate it into the system. Because a lot of Web3 create a system outside the existing system, and all the money was made and lost at the interface, be it through gambling or trading or, you know, like stealing. Whereas this technology kind of came out of a picture of the internet and our own society, and it's you've seen it's in Office, it's in Google, it workspace, it's in everything. Um, so that's quite a lot of ground that I think I just covered there. But this is some of the stuff that really excites me about, again, being that missing part of the pie. Value transfer rails are there, identity is there. Where was the intelligence? And is the intelligence aligned? Yeah, all of, all of that excites us too. And there's a ton there to unpack. But I, I think maybe before we dive even deeper in, into some of your answer there, I think maybe just describe for our audience, what, what is the origins of Stability AI? Stability AI? When did you launch the company? And, and what are some of the major, major milestones since? Just to kind of level set. Yeah, so Stability AI was launched to um, basically do a project called Kayak, uh, United Nations COVID AI, where I said, we need to organize the world's COVID knowledge and make it accessible and useful because everyone was doing their own things. And so we set up to like process some of the grants and things like that, but not really as a company. Um, and then a lot of big tech companies promised a lot of things and they didn't deliver. They said it was too dangerous or it just failed. And I was like, well, this is going to be bad because only people that can build models like GPT-3 are people with supercomputers, talent, and data. So then, you know, as part of kind of a Luther AI, which we just spun out, an independent community, Discord, it's got like maybe 50,000 members now, uh, we created an open source version of GPT-3, just with volunteers, and with uh, donations from Google, and then creating an independent open data set. And then I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing. And then in October of 2022, I was like, what if we could harness the potential of this talent and get it the resources it needs on compute and then build better data sets. And so that was when I kicked off Stability and kind of moved it um, to originally be, do a DAO of DAOs. So I was like, this is how you give value back to the community. And I was like, oh crap, the token economics does not work and the infrastructure is not there. And I realized that an open core model would be better. Build a great default model that people use from open source, open data, and now commercially licensed variants of that and build custom models for people. And, you know, now how many people want custom models or commercially licensed variants? It turns out to be a lot. Um, so we kind of funded the whole open source AI space and image generation space in particular. That's where I saw the most value. 
um, from grants to funding, researchers to other things. So with the original technology kind of behind Mid Journey, it came out of ours, plus I gave them like a grant to get them going and do the beta. Um, and across the whole space, we did it until, you know, some kind of academics came because uh, we were giving grants out and like, we have this thing, Latent Diffusion, that was built on our, one of our developer, Catherine Krausen's work, um, Conclusion Models, that was the foundation of DALI, OpenAI's one as well. And they're like, we want to scale. I was like, cool, we can scale it. Let's scale it together. And they suggested, of course, Stable Diffusion. I was like, great. Um, three of the five now work at Stability. And so it was a collaboration, came out in August of last year, and then in cumulative GitHub stars, overtook Bitcoin and Ethereum in two months. That took Bitcoin and Ethereum... 10 years, you know, and then I think cumulatively now across the whole ecosystem, it's overtaken Linux. I just want to say that that chart of the GitHub stars is one of the craziest charts I've ever seen. We'll, we'll like flash that up on the screen just during this, this segment, but I actually sometimes can't even find the line because I always forget it's like at the very end, you don't even see it. It's just, it's just straight up. It's kind of wild. It's an axis, right? It's like incredibly popular because anyone could use it and it was so useful. So in December of last year, four of the top 10 apps in the App Store were Stable Diffusion, this two gigabyte file is the entire backend, all the avatar kind of stuff, you know? Uh, the language models from the Luther AI community, uh, you know, we kind of did before we spun them off um, with some of our team, 25 million downloads, GPT-J, Neo X, Pythia, these kind of things. And now Stability, we're building the default models of every modality. We're one of the largest funders of compute in academia. Um, we have one of the largest supercomputer clusters in the world. Uh, we tried distributed training. It didn't really work very well. So just like just big, bigger. Um, and yeah, the idea is to bring this to the whole world. So every single nation has their own models and data sets, um, you know, and then people have these weird little files um, that they can use to create brand new experiences, be it creative across the media types or be it, you know, some of this language model stuff where you don't necessarily have to have Microsoft and OpenAI as a choke point on the internet because it's just really hard to do this. Um, and absent us doing this at scale, like, how are you going to do it? Um, it's just very, very difficult to keep up with people spending tens of billions of dollars. Amon, I want to just key in again, just on the open source nature of Stability AI. Like, maybe again, just go over, I know you kind of did there, but just kind of go over why you made it open. And then uh, even more kind of specifically, how that impacts the, the business model and the direction that you're going with the company. Sure. So these models are like really talented grads that occasionally go off their meds. You know, they're a research phase. So they can draw half of all code on GitHub now as AI generated. You know, they're like your little buddies, your little intents. Um, but when you use OpenAI, Anthropic, all these things, you're basically borrowing your grads from McKinsey. Because there's so much data you can send to them, which is why it's suitable for consumer use cases. If you have private regulated IP rich data, you want to hire your own grads. And so these pre-trained models, like they come out of university. I realized the biggest market was the private data in the world. Licenses, royalty fees, revenue share. Working with clouds, on-prem, um, chip mobile manufacturers to make these models available so you can have a Hindi insurance stable chat, you know, and transform your private insurance data in India into that. You know, have open data sets and models so this technology can proliferate. That's a big tan because private data is valuable. Whereas... I look at the other side of it and I was like, open AI Anthropic, all these guys, it's a race to zero because you're competing against Google and open AI and both of them are non-economic actors. So I thought it was bad business, but then also ethically, it was the correct thing to do, right? The correct thing to do was to make this technology available to everyone because otherwise you will get a digital divide. So open AI had this technology, DALI 2. It was based on Catherine's work, clip condition models and a bunch of others. You know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And it was the breakthrough image generator originally last year. Jeez, time flies. Yeah, it's like just over a year ago. Um, and they banned all Ukrainians and Ukrainian content from it. So you couldn't access it from Ukraine. And if you typed in a wonderful hill in Ukraine, a lovely day, it says we will ban you from violating the content policy because they deemed it could be political. And they undid that ban, I think, in March. So like nine months later. What if that was the only way that you could turn text to image? It would mean that everyone except for the Ukrainians had the superpower. Is that right? No, it's not. 
And so we were like, we need to democratize properly this technology because as we open source and release it, it isn't like releasing Bitcoin code or something like that. It's literally a binary file. This little two gigabyte magic file of something, like a mega codec. That words go in, images come out. Words go in, audio comes out. Words go in, it passes the MCAT. You know, like these are a very new type of thing from any type of architectural thing. And we have to give the building blocks to everyone at a base level because otherwise people will be left behind. And this is be transformative. You can give every child individualized education. You can do personalized healthcare. You know, you can have an antivirus for the media control that will come from fake news and like, I know, Scarlett Johansson, waifu bots whispering in your ear or something like that, telling you to buy shit. Uh, Ahmad, uh, so if we think about AI then as like a decentralized intelligence, as, as you put it earlier, can you elaborate on like, where do you see synergies between Web3 and AI, like how might we democratize access to AI through Web3, as, as you were just mentioning? Well, I think distributed intelligence as opposed to decentralized, because decentralized means that it could be part of a broad intelligence. Let's say collective intelligence could be that. Um, I think crypto is probably going to be the way that AIs pay each other at the start. Like what the standard is going to be for AIs that work on your behalf and my behalf, exchanging value. You know, crypto is the best way. Are they going to have bank accounts? Probably not. So kind of what are the rails for that? Another way is, you know, data sets are valuable, but less valuable because these things are few shot learners. What does potential distributed fine tuning look like? You know, I think that's another important one. But it comes back to this thing. What is crypto for? You know, crypto is basically for avoiding our institutions because our institutions are sclerotic. And I think the main reason for that is we are people of stories. And again, I think most of crypto is stories and the tribes that we kind of follow we scaled based on those stories, money being a story, all of finance is securitization and leverage. Securitization is a representation of an asset, the story you tell about it, and leverage is how well you tell it. That's how I like to put it. Then we had this Gutenberg press moment, the Gutenberg Bible, where we could grab our stories and put them into text, but it lost all this context. Like that movie Moana, you know, why does Maui have his fish hook and he pulls the sun up from the ocean? Because all the French Polynesians ever saw was the horizon. And so they're like, of course, that's what Maui does. You know, it's kind of odd. That context is, you can't capture it through text. Like, talking here, you're capturing all this subtle emotion of our faces. The transcript doesn't reflect that. You know, it doesn't reflect the bigger context. Where these models can capture context. And that's one of the main reasons that, you know, there's this poem, Howl by Ginsberg, um, about Moloch, this Carthaginian demon of disorder that comes into our systems. Our systems are like slow, dumb AI that eats our hopes and dreams, especially when we have to use Salesforce or do PowerPoints where we have to force our words into text, you know, because it loses this context. Um, and I think that this technology has the ability to turn our stupid AIs more intelligent, has the opportunity to root things for us to allow us to achieve our potential more. Because again, like blockchains provide an overhead above a standard system for a lot of things. Certain things it's good, certain things it's bad, but blockchains are not what crypto is really about. Crypto is about identity. And the value of identity is who are you relative to other people and who are you in yourself, foundational and functional identity. And those are both stories. And again, building the right AI distributed that you own that looks out for you as opposed to serving another master lets you tell your story better. It lets you access the resources you need better. Uh, so I think this is the big kind of potential thing because in a year we'll do this and we should have a hundred of our personal AIs analyzing everything that we've talked about before, you know, and saying this is the best way to have a productive conversation with Emad, you know, and these are the best things that you can ask so that it might go to your kind of individual. Now, that's a bit scary as well, because imagine if those aren't your things. Uh, and so one of my catchphrases um, is, uh, so, you know, not your crypto, not your keys, not your crypto, right? So I already had, uh, what was it? Not your weights, not your brain. And then one of the people who followed me on Twitter had a much better version of that, which is not your models, not your mind. And so I think that's where we're kind of moving right now. God, I love that. Uh, before we move on, though, I, I just want to point out that that Moana reference clearly demonstrates that if for some reason stability AI doesn't work out, this whole AI thing doesn't work out, Ahmad, you could rebrand as AI Dad and we could do a killer podcast. DeFi Dad, AI Dad, I think it'll be a big hit. Uh, yeah, definitely. 
So you were talking a, a bit about some of the like use cases for crypto or just how you see the purpose of crypto. I think uh, another thing I think crypto is all about is capital formation, but it is permissionless, censorship resistant capital formation. And, and probably that was m most obviously manifested for better or worse in ICOs back in the day. So I think it's also then fair to say that there's currently no easy way for the general public to get exposure to the upside of AI. And so I'm really interested in what do you think about the tokenization of AI startups as a means to raise capital or simply to provide obviously a way for early investors to coordinate and fund AI startups? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of regulatory arbitrage around that. There are jurisdictions down like Dubai <coughs> that move better on that. Uh, you know, we'll IPO as soon as we can. Uh, but it's just, it's difficult because where is the value on the chain or sort of value on the stack for entities? Like how many foundational model companies can there be? Because like, I'll give you an example. Our current supercomputer is 7,000 A100s. The fastest supercomputer in the UK is 640. It costs $100 million. You know, the fastest one in ASA is 640. So we're 10 times bigger than those. We'd be the eighth or eighth fastest in the world on the public list. And we're going 10 times bigger. That's insane, right? Like sometimes our language models run stop and you're like, what happened? ECC error, what caused that solar flare? And you're like, okay, language model stopped because the sun was angry with us today. You know, like dude, this is like levels above. But then there's people who build up the stack, you know? And so where is the value? And does the value go to the incumbents or does it go to the new entrants? And so there are all question marks around that. Um, because, like, again, as long as we exist, there will be compute available and talent available to build amazing models, you know? Um, because we're kind of up there. There are more and more distributed things. But again, where is the value capture if you have a default model that you can use? I don't think there'll be many open players. Um, I think it's more about using this, like going from, I think with iPhone 2G, 3G bit, we just got copy paste. It's still in the research phase. How do you implement this to achieve real value? So an example of this is utilizing decentralized identity, combining this with education for kids in the third world. Like that is an amazing use case because you can use this technology to capture so much information about these kids and give them all their own personalized tutor. That's pretty insane. You know, you can use it in finance if you want to create a financial services thing like robo-advisors are stupid. Now they can be intelligent, you know, and they can access all your crypto transactions and be fully understanding of that and recommend to you how you should kind of balance things. Actually, you know what would be probably one of the biggest, most funded startups in the space? You get this to do your crypto taxes. Oh, man, we, we need that. We need that like yesterday. Please, please build that, Ahmad. I'm not building that. I got enough to, I'm, I, I, I got freaking supercomputers and things, but there you go. Someone listening to this podcast is going to do that and pitch it to you and you'll be like, done. And then the total adjustable market is every single like freaking wallet holder <laughs> and it will do it. Ahmad, you mentioned on, I think on some other podcast I had listened to that you had been talking to one of the big four accounting firms and they were putting billions in because they, they really do see like an existential crisis for them that like. This is going to completely ravage their business if they don't find a way to uh, make it their own super tool for, for providing to their own clients. It's a really talented grad, right? And so again, like you could have a talented grad that you teach about, that knows about accountancy and then knows about crypto accounting. And so literally it will go through all your trades and it'll sort it. PwC have committed a billion dollars over the next three years on this. I met a telco that's committed $2 billion. This is my total addressable market analysis. A thousand companies will spend 10 million, a hundred will spend a hundred million, and 10 will spend a billion by the end of next year. And none of them know how they're going to spend it. Um, so there you go. Like, give them solutions, right? Because you can do things that you couldn't do before. Because imagine if you had, and this is how you judge the impact on your business, on society, on your own life. Push a button and really talented grads come out that are good at following instructions. Again, occasionally they turn a bit weird, but just get them to watch each other's outputs. You know, it's pretty all right. It's huge what's coming and it is existential for some companies and other companies will transform them because the AI can understand and tell stories better. It can do these things better. And again, it opens up this massive range of things when combined with value transfer rails and value transfer identity. 
because you don't need the intelligence to be essential coordinating intelligence. You have intelligences talking to each other. There were kind of things like Fetch AI and a bunch of others that were Gentic that tried this before, but this technology wasn't available then. Now it is. Meet Stater Labs, a non-custodial multi-chain liquid staking platform. With over 40,000 users across six chains, Stater is just about to launch Efax, a decentralized liquid staking token on Ethereum. Backed by some of the biggest names in crypto, their multiple audits with top security firms, bug bounties, and real-time monitoring are a testimony to their emphasis on security and safety. With a unique multi-pool architecture and tokenomics, Ethax empowers stakers everywhere to run a node with as little as four ETH and earn 35% more than solo stakers. Sign up for their Ethex Alpha today and be the first to know about $1 million in staker rewards. Ethereum is fully decentralized and Liquidity is a shining example of decentralization. Liquidity is a non-upgradable protocol where users can deposit their ETH and take out a loan interest-free. Users get their loans in LUSD, an unstoppable Ethereum native stablecoin that is solely backed by Ether. You can use Liquidity to buy real-world assets or to earn yield across 20-plus places in DeFi. More risk-tolerant users can also use the protocol to lever up on their ETH. With over 750 million worth of ETH locked into Liquidity's unstoppable contracts, get access to real DeFi. DeFi that's immutable, capital-efficient, and fully decentralized. Learn more at liquidity.org. So for, for this next series of questions, we're we're see seeing a lot of narratives form within the space between Web3 and AI, and, and just kind of want your like high-level thoughts or quick takes on, on some of these things and, and see how you're thinking about them. Uh, one that's come up recently, uh, well, we've been following it for a while, but I think it's the name has recently been coined, the Airbnb for graphics cards model, where you have idle GPU resources that are being utilized to help with machine learning workloads. Um, a few notable Web3 projects doing this are Render Network, Akash Network, and Jensen. Have you paid much attention to these pro projects, or is this is this an area that you're personally following at all? So I funded a whole range of initiatives like HiveMind and others in this area last year. But the reality is, to do these models, what you need is you need uh, top-of-the-range chips with interconnect. So you need them connected to each other because you move the data back and forth really, really quickly between them. And the interconnect is as expensive as the chips, so if you're trying to do distributed training SETI style, it just isn't really very efficient. And we've got enough compute to be able to create these as these little artifacts to kind of push out, so why would we do distributed training when we have enough compute access to do the training in an easier way? Right? Um, <clears throat> now, inference may be hitting a limit, um, and again, this is a bit like a GPU to ASIC thing, but again, you're moving to ASICs. So while GPUs are expensive right now, Inferentia 2, for example, on AWS has come out that's optimized for this. It's a quarter of the TCO. Um, I think there is a lot of kind of thing here, but then how can you justify that? Maybe on inference, there's a side thing. But like I said, I don't think that distributed training really has that much ground. Like it intuitively appealing. But again, if I can just go and get a gigantic supercomputer that's far more efficient than I just do that. Um, and again, I say this as me, but maybe there'll be a market for the people building fine tuning models or smaller models, um, because obviously we are at a scale that very few in the world can match right now. Next one here. So w with the emergence of AI agents, or as, as I like the phrase that you're calling them, highly trained grads, uh, like AutoGPT, do, do you see a future where many of these AI agents are using these payment rails smart contracts to autonomous, autonomous, autonomously execute dynamic transactions. Yeah, I mean, they'll be better than humans at that, right? They don't have a limbic system. Uh, so like if you look at the Cicero paper by Meta, they had um, eight different language models interacting, coordinating, and it beat humans at diplomacy. The current one-to-one -one model is a stupid model. You'll have hundreds of agents, and again, crypto will be the way that they communicate. The question is, which crypto? So, you know, right now we're evaluating all the chains, or like, do we have to build our own, or... You know, what does it look like? How are we going to make our agentic AIs do that? Because we have reinforcement learning teams as well as deep learning teams and others. And I think our models are likely to be the standard. And the wonderful thing is, writing a smart contract is a bitch. You know, like, especially a secure one. Like, it's just, this is easy to use. Like, literally, just do the faster AI course if you're a Web3 developer, and you'll be training models within a few days, within a week, right? Like, this is something a bit different because it doesn't have massive dependencies and things like that. 
Um, and I think what people did make from that, we'll finally get interesting things coming very quickly um, that then open up ridiculous potential for creating new jobs, better jobs, even as a lot of tasks get better, you know, because you remove a lot of the frustration, a lot of the things. The people that should be uh, fearful are probably the administrators. Again, this kind of Moloch thing. Like almost all of US CPI over the last, like, I don't know, decade or two decades is education and healthcare. But there aren't that many more teachers. It's all administrators. This is obviously better than just about any administrator, you know, when you use this technology correctly. I'm fascinated by the time uh, our children, I've, I've got a pretty young kids, like around like five and six years old. Uh, I'm fascinated whether they will have some sort of AI taught courses before they complete their, uh, what would be like here in the United States high school, but basically before university, I think it can happen in, in their lifetime. No, of course it will. I mean, like a, the only thing that's been proven to work in education, the only study ever is the Bloom two Sigma effect, personalized tuition. By next year, we'll have personalized tuition for every child in the world if they can afford it. And we'll figure out ways to make that scale, right? Um, because ChatGPT is a good tutor if you tell it to be. Again, it's like having a good grad tutor uh, kind of coming to you. My daughter was one of the first AI artists. She sold her first piece for three and a half thousand dollars in NFTs and then gave the proceeds to India Code Relief. Um, with one of the first BQ gang clip models that I designed for her. So she did a vision board and then a description of what she wanted to create. It generated 16 different images and then it did it again because she's got page one was different again and again and again until 11 hours later she got the piece that she wanted to make. And then she stopped making pieces after like 10. And I was like, why you done that? She's like, dad, there's a thing called supply and demand. You know, if this technology goes up, they want the OG AI artists and I'll be there. Wow, she she already understands scarcity like that. That's phenomenal. Yeah, she was seven years old. I was like, oh, crap, what have I done? And then I was like, okay, you're paying for your own university. And then she's like, do you really think I'll go to university with all this AI? I was like, oh, yeah, Smart all kid. this is going to change. All this is going to change. Yeah, I mean, she bosses me around all the time. But what does education look like if every single person has their own AI or 100 AIs looking out for them that can adapt the learning to if they're dyslexic or if they are, you know, auditory or visual. Um, so, you know, we're deploying tablets at scale to like all the kids in African nations and other things like that with a self-learning AI adaptive system, the Young Ladies Illustrated Primer. They're so, like, we're setting up all the things for that. Um, hopefully kick it off towards the end of this year and invite everyone in to cooperate. That is a step change because schools right now are basically childcare mixed with social status games mixed with Petri dishes. They're not actually designed for education. They're designed to turn you into a cog that then lumps into that monologue based system of control. Because one of the things I do when I give a talk, yeah, this is all very uncomfortable for me because I've got Asperger's. So I force myself to go, ah, maybe I'm a bit too bombastic in the way I do that. I say, how many of you are creative to the audience? And usually three to 5% put up their hands. Then how many of you think that not every kid is creative and none of them put up their hands? What happens? We're told we cannot be creative and we are not creative, but every human is creative. Some are more creative than others. And this technology is the great equalizer for that. So what does education look like? I think education looks like activating kids' potential, reminding them that they are creative and letting them create because creation beats consumption. And I think this is a step change that happens in the next five to 10 years. Or you utilize this technology to create a panopticon whereby you're turned even more into a box. And it's really convincing. And it's like, toe the party line, you know, um, like, toe the government line. And so, like, you know, we always talked a lot about Web3 and freedom. I think, actually, now's the real point. It's not about, like, okay, this Coinbase news just came out, or I just, like, right, whatever, right? You see the government's go, and that's kind of sound money. I'm not worried about sovereign money as I'm worried about sovereign mind. And so that's one of the reasons. Because these technologies are so convincing, perfect voices, perfect images, perfect resonance. There's a great book by Will Storr called The Status Game. Everyone should read it. Crypto people love it in particular. Uh, the Status Game is a society plays. And one of the things is that everyone's got a sublingual frequency of around 500 hertz. And when you're in a group, so you've got 419 and you've got 523, you adapt to the sublingual frequency of whoever the leader is. It's like a bee wiggling its butt to communicate, right? Uh, you think about things like that and all these sublingual things and all this sub thing. And you look at this technology across media types and you're like, attack ads, 
AI deep fake news, government propaganda. So it's going to be insane. It's going to be a complete system of control. And what's the antivirus? You know, what is the memetic antivirus? Google and Meta optimize for manipulation. YouTube optimized for engagement. The most engaging content was extremists, so ISIS took it over. What's going to happen when these slow dumb AIs optimize for manipulation and the governments do that too? And so that's what really, really terrifies me because, again, our kids, what are they going to be told? You know, believe in this. And the power of stories is insane because all wars are based on lies and the lie is that people are not people, all right? The Germans and the Japanese are two of the most sensible races in the world. I mean, come on, we all know this. What happened in 1945? That was stories. So this is kind of my great fear, but this is also my great hope because I see the rate of crazy innovation by providing the building blocks and letting people build with them. You then, of course, have to set good standards. And you're like, well, maybe it won't be that way. Maybe the default technology will be open, available to all, and we could build mitigations by building it out in the open. You know, I think that's a hopeful future for your five and six year old, my nine and 14 year old, where again, they'll have their own AI to represent them in an increasingly crazy old world. Eh? I think a hope for that future too, that we're, we're, we're all, um, alluding to here is, uh, some, some governance of that AI. And so actually this, this kind of brings us back to just, uh, another, I'll say trend or. Uh, just uh, a sector of of AI and crypto that uh, we've been tracking. And this actually goes to something I've talked with uh, a mutual friend of ours, RF Khan at Aletheia AI. Do you see a world where uh, large language models, or we'll just say AI in general, requires blockchain for data provenance and digital rights management and governance or yeah, anyways, that's that's one sector that I've been especially hopeful for, at least on the, the governance side. Yeah, you need something because, you know, like we've got detection algorithms and other things and we spent maybe five times as much compute on that as actual creation ones. But it's going to be increasingly difficult to say what is real and what is not, right? And so you need some sort of problem structure. Is it a blockchain? Is it something else for part content authenticity? We I mean, look at the blockchain solutions. I don't know. But you do need some source of truth. You need, uh, because again, like the cost of consumption went to zero in the last phase of the internet. The cost of creation is now going to zero. And so it allows people to tell better stories, but it also allows bad actors to tell better stories. And my thing is like, I was like, oh, if you do open source, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, open source is inevitable because it's required for governments and this and that, you know, and private regulated data. The stability I set up, and we're setting up stabilities in every country, starting with a few uh, in the next few months. We're set up to coordinate open. So you can actually have some standards. So you can have invisible watermarking. You can have attribution. These things put standards because otherwise it'd be crazy. Because the bad guys already have GPT-4. They already have these technologies. Because you can just download it on a memory stick and boom, it's gone. And it's very difficult to defend against that attack. You know, again, we have it with kind of our hard keys, right? Uh, our hardware keys. We don't even know what it's like. Again, do you think China doesn't have that technology? And this is really worrisome because you've got this technological exponential thing whereby you can flood a system. I mean, apologies if either of you are Scientologists, but this is how Scientology um, got RARS exemption. They literally did a massive campaign with lawsuits and letters that flooded the IRS until the IRS gave up. And this is what we have now. Like, how are you going to tell? So I think that we do need some sort of provenance. We do need to have some sort of these things. Um, and I think... We don't have enough time. We don't have enough time to do this. This is why I've been going so hard with stability, and I really hope everyone kind of backs us because you can't have a million entities doing this. You need to have a few, and then you need to have a million backing it up. Um, because, for example, right now, only two companies can build GPT-4 level technology. That's DeepMind and OpenAI. Next year, it's 20 because the new supercomputer is coming online. So our new supercomputer is 10 times bigger or faster than our current one. We can do four GPT-3s a day. It took like four months a couple of years ago, right? <laughs> Come on. But the data we feed these things is junk. It's like the whole of YouTube and the whole of the internet. So no wonder you get crazy whack drop things. And the bad guys get it, it comes even crazier and more whack drop. 
So I think um, it's a proper exponential, everything, everywhere, all at once. And this concerns me without those trust factors that you have, which like I said, part of it might be blockchain, part of it may be AI detection, part of it may just be like inoculation, right? Um, but it just moves too fast. Like I thought Web3 time, you know, crypto time, it was pretty fast. So I moved from Indian time. So Indian standard time is we arrived two and a half hours late to Web3 time. And now AI time is so much faster. It's like, oh, you know, last year, no, that was last week. I was like, oh, crap. By the way, for the record, I am not a Scientologist, but I can't speak for DeFi Dad. So, uh, Ahmad, I want to get kind of your take on just a couple more of these emerging narratives or trends or whatever whatever you want to call them in the crypto AI intersection. Uh, something that we're seeing like heavy exploration into and and also funding, like as much as funding and crypto has you know waned, this is one area that we're seeing a, a lot of I'd say innovation and funding happening, but. It's uh, this convergence of zero knowledge proofs and machine learning and just this kind of new design space that it opens up for smart contracts. Um, is this something that you're following or paying much attention to or have any thoughts on? Yeah, so, you know, we've got some zero knowledge proof kind of based work um, ourselves. Uh, I think it's suitable for really, really private data. But the reality is this model compression is so much that you can send models to the data. You don't need to train data from these things. You know, and you can have mechanisms to forget, mechanisms to anonymize, and other stuff like that. So I think it does have a use and it will be valuable, but it's not generally required versus some of the more big database zero knowledge uh, proof type of things. Um, because the scope of that type of data, I think, is relatively limited. Because these models, again, are like few shot learners. It would be like um, having, again, a grad that gets security clearance and then goes in and learns a bit, but you know, can't take the documents with him, right? Um, few shot learning is just immensely powerful, um, to say the least. Because again, it's like, what, do, what are you going to use it for? Like, people use these technologies in the wrong way. Taking 100,000 gigs into two gigs is not compression. It's not a fact-based machine. These AIs actually come out quite creative, and then we use reinforcement learning to turn them kind of boring into accountants. And it's a wonder that they can do what they do now anyway. Like they should be one part of a system and used as a reasoning engine. Um, and that doesn't require private data. There are much more efficient ways to store private data and knowledge and then basically have that at inference time um, through secure tunnel bits with this kind of thing and then maybe build an embedding layer or something from that. But like I said, I think it will have its place. It's just I'm uncertain as to the market size outside of enterprise for that and highly regulated industries, which tend to be a bit of a problem for crypto. Yep. Fair point. Um, okay. This is kind of like the last one in this kind of uh, high level thinking stuff. Uh, what What do you think of WorldCoin? Um, I think it is, I think that you have their hearts in the right place. I think that everything I've seen from the structure will not work. Uh, the requirement to kind of have this, the lack of kind of civil proofs, some things like most crypto solutions tend to be over-engineered in identity in particular. And again, you know, we have the DID standards at WTC and others. Um, and we've already seen lots of issues with it getting off the ground, but I really hope they do succeed because you need to have people trying new and innovative things around this because what happens if things go crazy and you need UBI, you know? And I think, again, um, this is what they're trying to do. Um, I just, like I said, I think you need more of an integrated solution than that. I think you... Irises are good as a foundational identity that you can then supplement with a functional identity. What is the functional identity they're going to put against that? This is one of my key concerns because we did like the global broadband plan for refugees with iris scans and refugee camps and all this kind of stuff. It works, but it's very difficult if you don't have default infrastructure. Like you have Alipay and WeChat Pay. They had no biometrics and they're all across China doing payments like that. You have Aadhaar in India, which is based on biometrics and kind of eye things. But again, UPI doesn't require biometrics for the vast majority of things. And so I think, again, a lot of these solutions tend to be somewhat over-engineered. So we should probably start to wrap up. Uh, just a few more questions for you. Uh, first, uh, do you have any advice for Web3 startups or crypto startups that are looking to implement an AI strategy? Like, is there any low-hanging fruit in terms of opportunities you see for using AI to, um, you know, leverage in your Web3 or crypto project? 
Yeah, so I think the key thing here is just about information flow. And again, what would you do if you had an army of really talented grads? Like crypto's always had this army of really talented people. You know, you should obviously implement it in your code base to have a more secure code and easier code. Um, but then you should think, what can be fundamentally different? So we touched on that thing earlier of like crypto taxes. Someone should do that, you know, like how can you make, how can you increase fun flow and reduce frustration using this technology? If you want to learn how to kind of use it, use the fast.ai course. That's what we set it up for, you know? Um, yeah, and I just think information flows and architecting is key around all of this. Uh, so, Aman, what's next then in terms of Web3 and stability AI? So we're building a Web3 team now um, that's dedicated to kind of look at all aspects of it because we're looking at attribution. We're looking at how do we handle payments between our agents, you know? How do we handle all of these things? And how do we support Web3 in general? Because, you know, we are the open leaders and champions. So we want to bring Web3 to the protocols, to the applications with partners, um, because I think it will make the good better. Um, I think we're all tired with a lot of the crap in Web3, but there is so much potential there, you know, to create sovereignty, especially at this time when everything is going to be increasingly centralized. So, uh, you know, if people are really super, ping us. We're hiring across the board and, uh, you know, hopefully help people activate their potential. Yeah. And if folks are interested in any of those open roles, uh, you can go to stability.ai to check that out under their uh, careers option there. Uh, lastly, more generally, what is on the horizon for Stability AI in the next six to 12 months? So we'll have models of every single type, 2D, 3D, audio, code, uh, music. Uh, please check, check out our Peter Gabriel uh, video, co uh, video competition as an example of that. That was pretty awesome. Um, and so you'll be able to build anything of any modality um, and then we'll bring it all together. So I think, you know, it's just let's get the benchmark models out and then let's nationalize them. So we're setting out stability in eight countries right now and we're planning to have a stability in all the countries to have open data sets, open models with really talented people upgrading their nations and their potential because as we integrate this technology, I think it's such a boom. And again, I think open has its place alongside proprietary. But what if we can make open the default, just like Linux and MySQL drive all of our other infrastructure? I think that'd be pretty amazing, you know? And then we can evade this trap of centralized control. Well, you had me at Peter Gabriel and Milana today. So uh, 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 I want to remind listeners that they can uh, learn more about Stability AI by going to stability.ai. Uh, they can also go on Twitter and follow Stability's uh, mothership account there at Stability AI. Ahmad, anything else you'd like to share before you go? Just we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. And I mean, this this was a really, really fun interview for us. So I, I hope you were able to enjoy it as much as we did. No, yeah. I mean, you know, the crypto people, please come and join our communities as well. We have hundreds of thousands of members across all the modalities. It's all on our front page of our website. And, you know, just learn and be active. You know how it is. Be positive. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I think it's been great. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. If you're a talented builder like Ahmad, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for future episodes of the Edge podcast, please check out our link tree at edge underscore pod. Mm -hmm.